So some of this I'm not going to get in. Yeah, I, I, that was the question I asked out there first because I wanted to know how much to beat on versus for CME. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so if I could get everybody's attention, I'd appreciate it. Uh, we probably won't take the whole amount of time today. I'm Kevin Brule, and Tiffany Ford, uh, who's here with me today, is going to also help in this presentation. I'm the director of ETSU Clinical Labs, for those that may or may not know. I'm a professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, obviously why I'm here today, I guess. First of all, did the residence faculty and this current rotation get an email from me last night, most of you? Uh, don't sweat it, it's, in reality, it is, as Dr. Jernigan so accurately described as he walked in this morning, it is another test. This one actually is one that's not real painful though, however, it is one that's required. Today we're gonna to talk a little bit about what actually a CLIA lab is in the realm of a physician's office lab, which should be of interest to everyone in this room, may not have been in the past, I can assure you and promise you that it will be in the future. Um, we're kind of using the CLIA laboratory as an introduction to competency assessment, which is a component that's a requirement and a federal regulation uh, for those individuals that are performing testing in your physician's office labs, of which, barring just a few, I would guess, uh, as you practice medicine, wherever it is in the United States, uh, you're going to be covered and actually regulated by these guidelines that we'll discuss. So it's very important that we try to understand what's being mandated and, and the requirements that we have so that we are able to, first and foremost, uh, if we get inspected, pass those inspections. How many think physicians' office labs actually are going to be inspected uh, Okay, we've got a couple hands. Let me tell you, uh, Tiffany and I actually have, th this was perfect timing for us to do this presentation. And we're not trying to force this upon you. We're trying to very gently bring you into the fold of this so that we can do the things required to oversee the laboratories and the physician's offices. However, as you guys go out and practice, a lot of you are gonna be pointed as medical directors. Um, of particular waved, moderate complexity, even high complexity labs as you go out and practice. So you need to understand this because those few that think that we're gonna be inspected, as I said, perfect timing. Two days ago, we had our reference lab state inspection uh, and we had the opportunity to go through a very detailed uh, eight hour, nine hour, one on one with our inspector from the state looking at all the CLIA regulations. Uh, we're a little bit more stringent with regard to we're a high complexity lab. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what the different complexities are so that you'll understand. Let's see if I can get my pointer going here. All the things that we talk about, we've all heard about CLIA and CLIA actually is a document, I guess I'll back up here. Disclosure statements, we have nothing to disclose. Tiffany and I actually have nothing that might impinge upon this as being uh, any conflict of interest with regard to the presentation. So what is CLIA? CLIA is a document that the federal government decided was going to be uh, developed and adopted back in the late 80s, and actually it was 10 years prior to that that the original form of it came about but it was then adopted in 1988 as this clinical lab improvement or amendment. And it virtually covers all laboratories. So no matter where you are, if you're in clinical practice, you're gonna be covered. As you might expect, you would look at this and you'd think, well, how is it regulated? What organization or what agency in the federal government regulates it? In the infinite wisdom, and this one to me is just perplexing and certainly is, is confounding, 
there's actually three agencies that oversee all aspects of CLIA. And they don't communicate very well together, and that's the problem. So how do we get to what the classification of a laboratory might be? If you start out with CMS, this, this is pretty much the main uh, driving force, if you will. They're the ones that actually are going to do the inspections. They're the ones that are going to collect the money. And they're the ones that are going to kind of do the oversight. They're going to do the regulations. They're going to be the ones that are going to determine what your organizations can do, what they call proficiency testing. These are blinded specimens that come in throughout the year that you have to do for every test that you do to make sure that your lab's actually doing and can achieve the level of success that's needed to be uh, approved for operating a lab. The FDA, however, is the organization that as a new test is developed and submitted for a categorization, they're the ones that are going to evaluate that and determine what that categorization is, whether it might be a wave test, a PPMP test, which is a physician's performed microscopy test, a moderate complexity or high complexity test. The CDC, this one's the one that kind of confused me. Their, their role is somewhat in education, uh, writing documents, writing some informational pamphlets and so forth. And there actually are quite a few very good documents out. They're on the CMS website. I think some of them are written, most of them by the CDC, but they're on the CMS website because that's kind of the CLIA organization so, uh, of prominence. So categorization of tests. Remember that each individual test is looked at by the FDA, assigned a categorization, and it fits into one of these. Is there a pointer on here? No. Stop. OK. So these categorizations, again, are, are, are basically on how difficult it is to perform the test. What sources of errors are available in performing the test? What mistakes can be made that could allow an incorrect result to be placed uh, in a patient's chart because of that. Waived, moderate, and high complexity. Keep in mind this PPMP is a subset of the moderate complexity test. So the waived is what's normally in the lab. Some of the urinalysis tests that we do, the CLIA waived strep genes, the CLIA waived uh, influenza test. Once we start talking about the PPMP, which is the license that this body, at least for our lab, in the physician's office that we're concerned about and talking about today, falls under that moderate complexity. Much higher level than most people think with regard to what are the requirements and regulations that are governing that particular performance of those types of tests. Okay. Once that particular laboratory applies for a level of testing uh, to get approved to be able to do laboratory testing in their lab, they basically can get a certificate of waiver here or this certificate of PPMP, which again, as I said, is that moderate complexity test. It's just a subset of that. When they do that, they get a certificate of registration as well that will say, until you're inspected, you can operate under this certificate of registration. At which time then, once they go through their inspection, they're either going to get this certificate of compliance or the certificate of accreditation. And either of those are fine to giving you the opportunity post-inspection that you've passed and you now are licensed and registered to perform laboratory tests in one of the categories. The only difference between these two categories is one is you're basically regulated by the CMS and or CMS has also approved some other bodies to do external uh, reviews and evaluations such as CAP, College of American Pathologists, COLA, and other state agencies uh, have the opportunity to, to have their own approved by CMS body to go in and inspect and approve these various laboratories. All right, so this is our license currently that we are doing our testing under in all of ETSU Physicians Associates laboratories, barring a few of the smaller labs and some of the other specialty labs. 
It is a PPMP license <laughs> under my direction. So the requirements that we have to meet have to obviously come back and the buck stops here, if you will. It's, it's that old adage is that we've got to get to the point where as a moderate complexity lab with the subspecialty set of PPMP, we've got to meet and achieve all the requirements of a moderate complexity testing laboratory, okay? And Tiffany's gonna go over a few of the procedures that we talk about here in just a little bit, but so here's some of the commo excuse me, components of a point of care test and running under this particular license that we have to be concerned with. So unlike, I'm gonna sneak out here a little bit so I can be in a little different direction here. If we look at all of the testing, we're, we're interested starting at the top and going clockwise. We're interested in all aspects of how the devices that we use uh, actually communicate with the various instruments and other things if they exist. Operations management, quality control. This is the one we're gonna spend some time on today, competency, compliance, inventory management, mobile access, you would, from the surface, you'd look at these and you'd think that, well, they don't involve what I'm doing. I'm, I'm a physician. They don't matter with regards to what I do. The whole basis for the laboratory and the regulatory agencies coming back in to monitor this, and in particular, the competency that we're going to talk about for the rest of this discussion today, is the federal government wants to make sure that those labs that are licensed and performing those procedures under this test category are able to efficiently and effectively do the test, report the test out with the highest probability that the test result that they came up with is correct. And to do that, as with any agency, there's a plethora of paperwork that has to be done either manually or electronically that monitors and does this. There's a significant amount of training that has to be done. and that training then leads to competency assessments to, to basically come in there and assure that the training and experience of those individuals doing the testing are competent and can do it with a high probability of success. Having said that, we're gonna talk about competency for those tests that we're doing in our clinical office of OBGYN, which is a subset of what this license is. This license oversees internal medicine and departments of surgery, department of pediatrics, our main lab in the physician's office at CEB building one, heart, infectious disease, et cetera. So there's, there's a, a sundry of other tests involved in this, but we're gonna focus down on three of the main ones that are done in our office to start with. This is the beginning of a process and I'm sorry for that, Dr. Jerningham, but there will be more quizzes and there will be more tests. Now, we're gonna try, th this isn't us against you. And it, you've gotta understand that. And, and believe it or not, two days ago when our state inspector came in, we had a new inspector this time, which is a little nerve wracking because you don't know what to expect. But the state has been very good about the inspectors they bring in. And we were certainly hopeful when the new one came in Wednesday that they would be the same and fall in line with what we've had experienced for the last 20 years that I've been here was that they would be informative, they'd be fair, and they would provide constructive criticism without trying to give you the, the, the death sentence, if you will. And in light of what we had expected or hoped for, that was true to form exactly what we expected and hoped for is what we got. And it was a very good experience. We had a minor deficiency that we're gonna to have to address. But other than that, uh, we got comments back like you run a very good lab, you guys are doing a great job. And those are the kind of things that you can understand that we're trying to strive and, and move towards for this particular aspect under this licensure, which is different from our reference lab. This one's much easier to deal with in one respect because we don't have as many tests that we've got to monitor. However, it's much more difficult because in this audience, this isn't your primary objective in, in the process, if you will, of your day-to-day -day activities. However, it is extremely important and integral to what you do. How many of you guys would like to go into your practice every morning knowing that any lab results that you order most certainly wouldn't be back until tomorrow? Would that affect how you guys practice medicine, both now and in the future? 
What do you think? What if you couldn't get any lab results back today? Good thing, bad thing? Minor concern, major concern? Okay. How about if, and they, these are, I'm, I'm going to kind of step off a little bit from the direction that we're heading. We've got some time because it's not going to take us the whole time for this. And, I, and I, I would be, I guess, not true to myself if I didn't go down this path. Laboratory medicine is, makes up 70% of the medical record of a patient through diagnostics and includes ultrasounds, NMRIs, other things, as well as diagnostic tests. We're being faced with reimbursement rate requested to reduce and have reduced. We've got some contracts that pay 42% of Medicare right now, commercial products for laboratory diagnostics. So Medicare set these rates at 100% saying this is what we think is reasonable and fair for reimbursement for laboratory tests. And these insurance companies now have decided that 42% of that are okay. The net outcome of that is for those that can survive, you've got to be very lean to do this type of testing. Now, it's no different in the physician's office labs. They're putting pressure on you to decrease the reimbursements as well. So it's a challenge at both ends. However, what's happened recently with payment reform, such as the Tennessee payment reform program that's going on, that has these incidences of specific areas, such as one of the current ones I know Dr. Jernigan's worked on is the perinatal event, it has laboratory tests associated with it. So your payment model is changing from fee for service to quality and how well you take care of those patients. And I don't think anybody would deny the importance and, and the flow of that is the quicker that you can identify the problem and come up with a differential diagnosis, the quicker you can most appropriately treat that patient and the healthier that patient will be. And that's back to my question, well, what if? What if labs don't exist because the pressures have been so much on them that now we've exited to the point where we've got two reference labs, major reference labs in the United States? There's no such thing as critical results anymore because 24 hours later with the result coming back to you may not be good enough. And I'll give you an example. When I looked at trying to convince some of the carve outs that insurance companies have mandated that we actually do in the laboratories locally, and I explained to them that we needed to be able to do a basic metabolic panel or a comprehensive metabolic panel so that we would be able to actually give those critical results back when they came and we could do them the same day. Those weren't on an exclusion list. Unfortunately, they told me, well, they're not needed on an exclusion list. And I said, but what about the critical results? And I, they said, well, give me an example. I said, well, what about glucose? What if glucose is 600 and I need to call a critical result? They said, well, glucose is on the exclusion list. And I said, well, I said, that's great. But unfortunately, we pick up 80% of them in routine comprehensive panels and, and basic metabolic panels, and they're not on the exclusion list. Well, it'll be back within 24 hours was what the response that I got from this particular insurance company. And I said, well, that's not good enough. And I said, it certainly didn't help Mr. X, who died last night because you called this morning telling us the glucose was 600. A little too late. So competency assessment, let's move back to that. So it is important that, that it, you guys at least be aware that, as Dr. Holmes just mentioned, that some of the tests are important. The reason we were seeing a large decline in physicians' office labs here in the last 10 years for the reasons that I just described, some of the pressures and so forth, they weren't cost effective, they weren't making money. We're now seeing just the opposite. Why do you guys think that we're seeing a rapid increase in physicians' office labs? Any thoughts why 
Why would they increase now? You think it might have to do with they're making more money, insurances are paying them more money? No, nah, that's probably not liking I saw Dr. Rouse said, no, no, no way that's happening. Yeah, some of the pressures of, of the, these different subsets of insurance organizations, some of this, the uh, ACOs that have been set up has kind of trying to do that better patient management. They need it closer so they can do that. Some of the payment reforms ha has forced that upon us. Also technology. We've been asking for 20 years to get these molecular tests into the point of care environment. We're starting to see that happen in, a, in an enormous fashion. I predict by the end of the year, GC Chlamydia will be waived in point of care in our office, if not first quarter next year. Things like that that probably five years ago we didn't think was really possible are gonna be there. I think we're gonna see a, a, a massive increase in these point of care labs that are doing these subset of tests, as mentioned, that are valuable, and I think laboratories are going to restructure such that these laboratories are going to be structured so that triage programs are set up, patients call in with symptoms, they're going to hit a protocol. That protocol is going to say, come in for your appointment at 2. However, it's going to say, come in for your appointment at 1, get your blood drawn, so the results can be sitting in the EHR when you walk through my door. I'll have all your lab results. I can treat you at least for the most part based on certain protocols. Now that's not for everything, but there's, there's a lot that I think will fit into that. Um, so I think we're gonna be training and doing more things such as this to make sure that what we're doing in these laboratories, because what we're doing right now and what we're gonna go over for competency here is going to expand to the point where there's a lot Excuse me, one second. There we go. Or no, we don't want to hit the bottom one, didn't I? I can't get to go forward or backward. Thank you. So personal competency, and we're going to now focus directly in on this. Our requirements are going to require this. It's the ability for the individual performing this, which in our office, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, this is somewhat informational for Tiffany and I as much as you, as we try to develop this competency program and transition it from what was being done in the office to what we are required to and are going to do under our guidance, if you will. We need feedback. Procedure manual, residence, attendings. Have you guys, do you know where your procedure manual is for let's say uh, to perform a wet prep or to perform fern testing or any test that you know? Do you know where your procedure manuals are? Have you read them? That's a good question right there. Do you have them? They, they probably do exist. Um, they probably haven't been updated. That's probably good. <laughs> After we go through the next six months or so, I promise you, you will know where they're at and they will have been available to you to have read. I won't say that you've read them, but, or will read them, but we'll do everything to encourage you to. They'll be simple uh, and straightforward. So that's, that's probably one of the starting points. We, we will get procedures in place such that you do have those available. Again, we want you guys to be able to perform these to the best of your ability and we'll do everything we can do to help you and assist you in this process to get us back on track. Why? This is what the federal government in regulation of, of our laboratories are saying with regards to what we have to do. And they basically have these six procedures that are minimal that we have to meet. 
and I'm just going to read them verbatim because they are important. We must have direct observation of routine patient test performance, including patient preparation and, if applicable, specimen handling, processing, et cetera. We must be able to monitor the recording and reporting of test results. This is how we're assessing that you can do what, what you're actually doing and we're gonna report out for a patient result. We've got to review, make sure that the review of the immediate test result worksheets, quality control sheets, persistency testing, preventative maintenance records, et cetera. Such things that microscopes, you know, is the microscope being maintained appropriately? Direct observation and performance of instrument maintenance and function. Even though we've not got into, you do urinalysis in your offices too. There are many things that can affect in a urinalysis machine and not cleaning it, I can assure you, is one of them. And that's one of the areas that we're going to have to address a little bit further in the OB office. You got to clean them after each time you use them uh, or it will have an effect on the, the quality of the results that you get from them. Assessment uh, of the individual to perform the test. Can they do it appropriately? Um, can they handle if there's analyzers involved, microscopes involved? Do they know how to use a microscope? Do they know how to focus? I can't tell you how many times, and I'll use text as an example because that way I'm not in stepping on any toes, but techs that have been through school come in and we'll ask them as part of our hiring processes to you know, perform a a manual differential on a blood smear or look at um, your analysis and, and, and do a microscopic. And they'll look through the scope and look through the scope and you'll see them f trying to focus, 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 and they'll say, well, I just really don't see them. They couldn't even focus the microscope. So if they can't get to the layer that has the cells, it's really difficult to tell what's in that sample, okay? And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just you've got to be willing to understand your limitations so that you can learn what you need to do to make sure that, I mean, none of us want to admit, well, we don't always know what we're doing. We could read the best wet prep there ever was if we could find it. I mean, it's not, it's not that we can't do it. It's, we know what to look for, but if we can't find the layer to look in of, of a particular microscope slide, it's of no use. And then we also have to assess the problem solving skills, if you will, of, of, of what they're doing. So, so these are the criteria that we're actually going to eventually grade and each and every one of you on, if you will. And this will be through a process where this is an introduction. We're actually going to have to do a wet lab at some point, whether we can use some time such as grand rounds period or something to do this, where we actually have scopes, possibly digital here that will be available to let us go through a series of things so we can do this. Why? Well, again, the federal government, what do they require us to do? How often? This is the scary part. Each and every individual, physician included, it, when we're talking about PPMPs actually, and, and those individuals can do the test, can nurses do this test? No. Can untrained staff? No. Physicians, they're nurse practitioners, they're, they're kind of subset designees, if you will. Physicians assistants can. Technicians, if they're licensed, obviously included in that process. So it, it's a very limited group of individuals that can legally perform these in your office. I mean, we can think back 10, 15 years. I know when I first got here, who was doing them in OB office uh, or doing a lot of them was, wasn't any of those above, and that's okay, but that was 20 years ago. Now it becomes a little bit more of an issue. Here's the probably the most challenging part of this one. So they're required to do it prior to ever starting to report them out, okay? So initially we have to do the competency assessment on everyone coming into our practice and make sure they can do this before they do one and report it out. The time frames then are those new employees, we have to do it twice the first year. So before they start in a six month period to reassess that. Now, once you do the initial one, we can, which would you rather have, Dr. J? Would you like us coming in every day? Or would you rather have that little quiz come across the internet? I think you'll choose the test this time. Begrudgingly, but nonetheless, you'll choose the test. And then yearly thereafter. 
So the first one's the, the big part of it. And we've got to find a process that works, and it's, it, it may well be this this form here that, that we try to work out to do this. Uh, we are going to start with the, the new residents. I've talked to Patty in that training period, the first coming in in July, is it, Patty? We will do that at that point in time so that we're kind of ahead of the, the game, if you will. At this time, I'm going to let Tiffany talk to you a little bit about some of the things specifically to the testing that we're doing in the office under PPMP and also some of the procedures and things that we're looking for to try to give you an idea of what, what the procedures entail. Obviously, it's, it's different. You're, you're probably not using this exact procedure in the office right now. That's okay. We will adapt whatever the procedure and the protocol is that we put in your procedure manual will fit what you're doing. Uh, now, we're going to have to have a consensus. So if, if you're all doing it differently, we got to come with a consensus that this is the way that at least that we're going to do it. If you deviate from that, as long as competency-wise you can show that you get the same results, that adaptation will be okay, I guess, uh, as long as you get the same results. Miss Ford, Miss Smith. Tiffany recently got married, and it's, I don't know what her last name is at this point, so I call her both. Okay. morning. Before I get started, do you, I, never, I always hear people talk about doing KOH and wet preps in your office. I never hear anyone mention doing a fern test. Do you guys do fern tests in your office? Here in the, okay. <coughs> do you? Okay. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> I was just curious. Okay, there are... <laughs> There are three different kinds of PPM that we believe you do in your office. If you do any other testing, it would be great for you to let us know so we can address that and make sure you have procedures in your office and we go over those and make sure everyone understands. The fern test, the KOH prep, and the vaginal wet mounts, are there any more that, as physicians, you do in your office? No? Okay. The fern test is done on vaginal secretions, and I won't read the procedure to you. You can read it. Um, the biggest thing with the, with the fern test is to put it on the slide and let it dry on its own. Don't stand there and breathe on it or put it under a hair dryer or don't encourage it to dry more quickly. So other than just like waving it around is fine. But just kind of let it dry and then you're going to look for the fern-like pattern for a positive test. And these are examples of fern tests pointer. Ha. Huh. What about this one? Is that a positive fern test? Okay, is it hard? We can't focus on this booger, can we? No. That's a negative fern test. It just looks like a bunch of dried muck. This one is a negative fern test. It's a lot of epi cells, it looks like. This one is definitely a fern pattern. It's really pretty. And this one is definitely a fern pattern too. How many positive fern tests do you typically have in your office? Do you have a bunch? In the office? No? Has it? The next one is a KOH prep. And something that I have noticed, because every time I come down and do urinalysis QC, because the lab does urinalysis QC on your machines in the office, is that you have a bottle of saline and you have a bottle of KOH. Every time you do those, or not every time, but once a week, I try to keep an eye on them. Check and make sure they're not expired. Because if they expire, they lose their, well, the saline can be contaminated and have other little stuff floating around in it. And your KOH can lose its action material. So just kind of glance at those. <clears throat> right now they are ordering more, by the way. So the KOH prep, you're supposed to put it in a very small amount of saline. I don't know how you guys do it but put it in a very small amount of saline, shake, 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 to try to dislodge anything from that swab, and then get a drop of that. They say smell it. We don't, 
we usually don't put our nose right down there, but we can smell the saline. And then put a drop of KOH, cover slip it and let it sit. We cover slip it first. Some say not to first, some say let it sit. We cover slip it first to hold everything kind of together. And then you wait about five minutes and look at it. And what that KOH does is it breaks down all the cellular material to hopefully just leave the fungal elements to make them a lot easier to see. The biggest problems with KOHs is that people usually rush them and they don't give it that time to let everything degrade. These are examples of what you may see in a positive KOH. The first one being the pseudohyphae and the next one being the budding yeast. The last one is the vaginal wet mount. I think you guys do a lot of vaginal wet mounts based on the status of your microscopes. It looks like a lot of them have kind of corroded on the scope. But um, the vaginal wet mounts are pretty easy. You do the same exact thing with the saline. You put a drop on the slide and you cover slip it and you take a look for it. Basically the things that you're looking for in a wet mount, if you send them to the lab, we report out more things. Basically the things you're looking at in a wet mount are trick, Gardnerella, glitter, clue cells, and yeast. Also in the lab, if you send one to us for some reason, and we do get them, um, we'll report out red cells, white cells, and bacteria. And those aren't really good. But other things you can see, of course, would be sperm. And these are the different things, sperm, white cells, red cells, epis fuzz, basically, fiber, mucus. I'm not sure. Those aren't really good. This, however, is a good picture of a glitter cell or a clue cell. They're not always that pronounced, but. And here are other examples of a clue cell. And yeast comes in many forms. And then trick. They are so fun. I hate it when people have them, but they're so fun. <laughs> so <laughs> we don't get to see them alive very often, but, uh, but they're cute. They kind of look like little aliens or those little ugly dolls that you see. Any questions about wet preps, KOHs, or fern tests? Lab people have a very unusual we really do. approach to things to get you through. Looks like a cyclops, really. Look. They're so cute. And Giardia are just the cutest little things. They look like little ghosts with their little eyes. Kind of look like. Another example, which isn't this, but we've got a, many of you may or may not have known, uh, we've got a tech in our lab that very fiber individual, her name's Meg, wonderful individual. About every other day or so she comes to me and shows me a new picture of a blood smear she goes look I, and she, she'll she have a cellular look at neutrophils or yeah, it's the neutrophils and, and in the neutrophil the DNA matter the DNA matter and we've got now ducks smiley faces that they, they literally and yeah. we'll, we'll probably publish this at some point and send out in a newsletter because it's absolutely astonishing. But she's everyone she's documenting that she's finding, and she's even found some things that that uh, are very colorful, if you will, for male and female anatomy. That that would, would absolutely you look at it and you go, oh my goodness, <laughs> and that's found in this material in these cells. So it, it's a an odd but fun group to work with. Okay. All right, so. Here you go, you want this? So where are we? Like I said, when we started, you all should have gotten an email. And this is just, as I had mentioned in the beginning, this is an informational, interactive, we want to be like I had alluded to with the state, where we want to be thought as friendly. We don't want to be thought as the ugly, difficult, sister or brother, however you want to term that, uh, that we all have, that we've got those favorite siblings and then we have the one that, as my son would say at this point in his time about his sister, I wish she would just move somewhere else. Um, that's not going to happen and we don't want to. We want to work with you to try to develop this. 
we use uh, for both information and for some assessment of where we are in that process, and we want to share that with you, this training site called medtraining.org. You got an email that you should be able to get to uh, that it requires your user ID being your email, and your password is going to be your last name with the capital first initial. Okay, so your email. The only difference is, and I don't know that it matters, but the the medical students, it's you've got the go, you've got the your last name or whatever it is at goldmail.etsu.edu, whereas everyone else is your email at etsu.edu. Yours has got that goldmail thing in there. Password, your last name with the capital first initial. If you have any problems, email me back. What this is going to get you access to is this website. And let's see. Okay, and then this website has quite a bit of material. What I have opened up for you all and you should have access to is you should have training sites to physician perform, perform microscopy procedures where you can go through and go through these lectures and it's got slides and so forth. If, those aren't mandatory for those, but if you, if you feel like you want to go back and review some of that, you're certainly welcome to. And there's a competency test then that is mandatory on fern testing and wet prep. And you do need to take those. There are five slides. You can take them more than once if you don't do so well the first time. I want you just to get in there and feel like, okay, this is what I'm looking for. It will tell you what to look for on the competency test. It will take you a whole five minutes to finish both of them but it will at least get you started in this process to where at some point in the next six months, we will be able to then come back and start truly getting this to where we have to have it to meet this. And what's this? This is basically our policy and it's almost finished, but it will be available in the department soon to you see this is what we, as the director of the lab and the requirements that we have for having a license of PPMP in the OBGYN office, these are the things that we have to do. And it's just, it's, it's a, basically an outline of the requirements for assessing competency for those individuals. And we've went over that. And then what we'll do at the very end, uh, as typical policies, it's 10 times more verbiage than you need. At the end, each and every one of you will have this form in your hands that says, on wet prep, which is a moderate complexity PPMP, on those six elements that we told you we're going to evaluate, did you pass or fail? And we will do them till you pass. And part of it, it's going to be a combination of through digital, through website, through if we have a workshop. We just have to get up to speed. It's going to be a little painful in the beginning to get back up to speed. I promise you it will take less time than it does to drink your coffee at Starbucks or whatever you guys, whatever your thing, uh, it will take less time than it does that. We will make it as painless as possible. What's the outcome and the benefit of this? I promise you, you will do a better job for those of you doing those procedures and understanding what your limitations are. More importantly, you will understand what I consider to be the bigger picture at this point is that we are gonna see a massive change in how laboratory medicine is done at the point of care. I'm, there's no question of that. And the reason I know that, the minute the insurance payment reform where you now are going to be evaluated on how well you take care of patients by claim data of you for the same popular patients versus somebody else. If you can identify that they have a specific bacterial infection on vaginitis versus a yeast infection and you treat it appropriately and you treat it quickly, the outcome of that patient is going to be better, the cost of that patient is going to be better and hopefully that will be used to help 
recoup as much money as possible for the services that you're providing that you should be paid for. It even gets much more, I mean, if you think about it, there, there's a lot of ways, what I can see happening is take vaginitis and take GC chlamydia. As these things get to be 20 minute molecular procedures, which is the, the sensitivity and specificity is extremely higher in those procedures when they move to that molecular platform, can be done in a triage method a reflex method where you're coming in, you say, well, your symptoms dictate we should start this. We, we don't do this carte blanche across the board 50 tests. We, we very selectively try to match the history with the things and needing a few more pieces of information that we might be able to use the diagnostic testing for. We perform those, they're negative, then we like the thyroid cascades, we can reflex them to other tests as appropriate or as needed without intervention, without involvement of having to reorder to re-stick the patient, bring them back in. And I think as we do this and have the availability of all these additional tests that we can swing, if you will, the little bit of, of, of the treatment and the taking care of patients back in the physician's hand and out of the insurance's hands. And I think that's going to happen. Now insurance will change that, uh, unfortunately, in their favor again at some point. But it, it does give us some leverage. Uh, and I think that the interesting thing, too, about these laboratory tests are with the rate at which they're going to come out, uh, the, the challenge or the question that still remains, uh, one of the ones, just to give an example of this, how companies view these as being so important. Yesterday, uh, Abbott Laboratories bought Allure Diagnostics, and Allure Diagnostics are the ones that have the first wave molecular test for strep and influenza we're actually doing in the office now for $5.8 billion yesterday. The reason Abbott Laboratories bought them was Abbott Laboratories did not have the point of care market in their arsenal, if you will, like some of the other big companies do. So they're, they're investing in these companies that are going to be putting this type of testing because they know the numbers that are getting ready to come out. And I think, you know, we, we can ignore it or we can try to embrace it and figure out how to use those that are of value to us. We thank you for your time. Uh, please, I'll know who's went to the site. I'll email you if you haven't went to the site. I think I put a deadline on there March 1st. Uh, I just opened it up. They can take as many times as they want. Yeah, you can take as many times as you want. So, and, and it gives you the answer. It's five questions. You, you take the test. It tells you which one you missed and why you missed it. And you can say, I want to take that again. So if you can remember five things for two minutes, you're going to get 100. Thank you so much. Well, that's, I would probably.